So um, we're really fortunate tonight to have a famous person. <laughs> Susanville famous is not like famous. <laughs> um, I think you've won a lot of uh, you know photography awards, I believe. It's a couple. A couple, yeah, mm -hmm. more than a couple. So we're really happy to have Randy here tonight. And I said, would you come and talk? And he's going, well, what would you want me to talk about? And he narrowed it down to, uh, you know, how do you take those pictures? So give it to Randy. Fun. Well, welcome. I'm Randy, and uh, let's see. My mom's here. All these people are like family. <laughs> they felt bad. So, <laughs> grew up in Greenville and Susanville, and have been local for a long time. Um, got into photography. Well, at a really young age, um, my dad's mom was a newspaper photographer. When she passed away, my aunt gave me one of her cameras. And I was, what, 12? 11, 12. And I just devoured everything I could about photography and how it worked and all that. Got super into it. Of course, that was before digital and all that. Junior high, high school, college came, and, and uh, that all kind of went away and, and fell by the wayside. Couldn't afford a good digital camera for um, a long time after that. Finally got a good digital camera in 2017 or 18. And I really kind of dove back in at that point and took off with it. So I love uh, wildlife photography. That's probably my, my, my passion with photography, mostly because of the, uh, the challenge of it and the, the difficulty of getting a, a really good wildlife shot. I was always fascinated by the whole concept and how those people did that. And uh, so I tried to become one of those people. So we'll give you a little bit of that quest um, Tonight, so when, when uh, we talked about the topic of the predators of Lassen County and uh, kind of photographing some of those hard to get close to local critters, um, it reminded me of my sort of goal that came up a few years ago of the what I what I call at the time the the Lassen County like Hall of Predators, right? We've got these these uh, very cool predators around here that that we don't see much of. And I got, a, I got a fun picture of a coyote, which kind of launched me into this and um, led me into camera trapping and all that also. So I'm gonna give you kind of a story behind some of these shots, walk you through some of these uh, critters and what I've learned about them in, in the process. All right? So we'll just kind of dive in. We'll do questions at the end. Um, if you guys have any, any questions for me about any of them. So hold those as we go through and we can go back and, and take a look. So this is, kind of the inside of what's called a camera trap. I wanted to just lay out up front the difference between like a trail camera and a camera trap. A lot of people call trail cameras camera traps and it kind of makes my skin crawl because they're not, right? A trail camera is this small, I meant to bring one in and I forgot, but you, they're very popular around here. Hunters use them to kind of figure out where animals are. Um, a lot of people have them on their property to see what's passing through. They're getting better and better. They take fairly high resolution photo and video, but they're very compact unit with a small camera, little motion sensor on there, and it's usually infrared um, images at night, right? They have an infrared light bank, so you get these black and white sort of mysterious looking photos at night, and it just made me want more, right? That led me eventually into camera trapping, which a camera trap is a fairly complex situation. I got a couple pictures I was gonna show you when the batteries fell out of this thing in my pocket. I'm and we'll talk about it. By the way, I'm recording uh, this tonight because a few people on my Facebook page demanded it, basically, or asked for it. But I'm going to put it on my YouTube channel, so anything you say can and will be used against you. Um, I'm on. They're, they're on. <laughs> Somebody watch him. I saw him come in in the back. Hi, Rod. That you. Uh oh. There it went. Okay. So the camera trap is a DSLR camera. What you're seeing here is regular DSLR camera. This is a receiver that gets a signal from a trigger, which we'll talk about in a second. The trigger is like a motion sensor, like what turns your motion lights on um, in front of the garage, right? That is wired into the camera like a remote shutter release, right? In the hot shoe of the camera is a, another, another trigger 
that sends a signal to more receivers that are on lights, flash units that I mount like in trees. This is wireless system. These are just battery packs um, with a bunch of batteries in them. So this is kind of the whole thing laid out on the ground. Um, I built a case for mine out of like a, like a Pelican case kind of style, cut a big hole in it, got some PVC plumbing and epoxied it in the front for the lens of the camera and put a filter in the front of that for total weather protection, right? These are just PVC pipes with um, black tape around them that my flashes slide in there with a battery pack and a receiver on them. And this is the trigger, um, which is a pretty fancy little piece of equipment actually. This is a company called Cam Traptions that makes this one. There's a few different companies that make them, but they're based in the UK and you might have seen this guy that came up with this company. He got one of the first pictures of a black leopard in Africa with his whole system and he went like mega viral popular and he writes books and he's one of those guys now. But he uh, started this company. The, the fancy thing about that trigger is it'll operate on multiple channels. I don't know how crazy you want me to get with the description, but basically it'll, it'll sense motion. It'll tell the flashes to wake up because the flashes are in like deep sleep, right? And then it will tell the camera to wake up and fire. And then the other trigger in the camera tells the flashes to fire and everybody's all awake at exactly the right time and everything pops at the same moment because that triggers sending fancy signals. And you can set it to do a whole bunch of different things, but that's the basics, right? That's probably all most of you want to know. <laughs> want to know more, we can talk later. Um, that's a little bit of the battery taste of what, what's really going on there. All those little holders hold six uh, AA batteries. I think when, when it's all said and done, it's set up in this full array. It's like 46 AA batteries powering the whole thing. So I do a bunch of recharging and I can get about three weeks out of the whole setup out in the woods before I start losing flashes and, and batteries start, start dying. So, that is the deal. Um, it's very weatherproof. This is the trigger hanging out down here in the snow. Um, the camera housing is here. I made a visor for it out of a, a Starbucks cup and it works very perfect. There's, there's this whole little world of people online, right, that make these things and uh, I'm working on building another and uh, kind of expanding the, the camera kingdom a little bit. Um, so I'll mount it in trees, I'll mount it in a whole bunch of different places depending on, well, we'll talk about that, where, what animal I'm after and what, um, what I want to accomplish, but wrap it in camo sometimes. Honestly, that matters like not as much as a lot of people think. A lot of animals um, are very comfortable being around human stuff, right? We have mountain lions coming through the edges of town, they're behind, you know, burned out cars and whatever else is out there in the woods all the time. Um, so it's not like animals see this stuff and run the other way, you know. So the camouflage is arguable, you know, whether it actually helps a whole lot. I always feel like more concealed is better, but I've had, I've gotten pictures of bobcats and foxes that I can think of with flashes like on a tripod, like that camera back there, just in the middle of the woods. They don't, they don't care. Um, but camera trapping led me into this whole world of animal behavior and tracks and sign and how they get close to some of these animals. Um, to me, it is probably the most difficult form of photography, that at least that I've ever played with. Um, a lot of people think it's hanging a camera on a tree and hoping for the best, and that couldn't be further from the truth. It is, it's a challenge to try to get into a place where you know that that animal is, is gonna be. And that's one other thing I should mention is, the camera can't wake up and do anything automatically in pitch black, right? You have to set everything manually, knowing exactly what your light situation is going to be. So you have to not only get to the place where you think you want to be, but the, I mean, the focus of the camera is manual. You have to know exactly where that animal is going to be. The flash settings, how bright they are. I'll set a flash over here at 1 16th power and one over here at 1 quarter power and one back here at 1 8th power, depending on the the scene that you're trying to create and the lighting that you want. It's basically like setting up a photo studio in the woods, right? But everything on the camera from shutter speed to aperture to what the ISO is doing, um, 
to the power of the flashes, the distance from the subject, where the trigger is positioned, where the animal is going to be when the shutter fires. All of that is has to be calculated before you <coughs> before you get a picture, right? There's a million variables, and you only control like 500,000 of them, right? The animal is really going to decide whether you get the shot that you want. So it's not hanging on a tree and hoping for the best. You know, it's a, it's a lot of work. And it starts usually with looking at Google Maps or topographic maps. Once you know the species that you're after, learning about the animal's behavior and, and figuring out where you think it's going to be in the place that, that, you're, that you're looking. We were talking earlier about um, just the, the difficulty of how you find that spot and where you, you know, where you go. Um, but it's, it usually starts on the maps and it usually starts with learning about the animal. We were talking about hunters and the whole world of, of animal knowledge that comes from hunting. Um, I read hunting blogs and I, I, I've gotten most of what I know about setting up trail cams, where and how, and narrowing down where animals are gonna be from the, the world of hunting. There's a lot of animal knowledge um, out there and a lot of it comes from the hunting community. But if I'm looking at a place like this, I'm trying to figure out where like natural pinch points or bottlenecks are. You kind of go to those places and you, you find within that a place where you can narrow down exactly where an animal might, might perch for you for a, for a photo, right? That process makes you have to learn about tracking and, and animal sign and figuring out um, what animal you're looking at when you see sign on the ground. And that um, led me into that whole world. And I've learned quite a bit. I'm no expert, I'm not a biologist, um, but I've learned a lot about tracks. I was joking on my Facebook page, um, but if you, ask, if you ask Facebook or you ask the internet what these are, my well, latest pointer, you've got a giant mountain lion, giant mountain lion, giant mountain lion, <laughs> giant mountain lion, and Sasquatch. <laughs> That's what the issue is. So you have to really kind of, you know, learn a little bit more on your own. Um, just while this is up here, some of these pictures will come up again and I'll throw more of them up there, but this is a coyote, um, canine versus feline. That's a bobcat, okay? Real quick, canine tracks almost always show claw marks. Feline tracks almost always don't. All right, I've seen mountain lion tracks with claw marks when they're trying to get up a hill or that kind of thing. But almost always, general rule, cats walk with their claws retracted, right? Dogs are more oval shaped, cats are more round. Like the distance across a cat track is almost always almost the same as the distance from tip to tip that, right? The two like outside toes on a dog track are a little bit further like back from the front toes. The heel pad is more of a triangle, and on a cat, those two, those two toes are a little more forward because the heel pad is much bigger, it takes up more real estate, right? And you have more of a line of toes. At a glance, when you're used to seeing them, it makes sense real quick, right? A lot of people say the X thing with the dog tracks, have you heard about the X thing? In a dog track, most canines, you can make an X in the negative space of the track slicing like those front two toes are in the front. You see what, see what I'm talking about? In a cat, you can't do that. You're running to the heel pad and you can't make that X because the heel pad is bigger. This is a gray wolf, local Alaskan pack. This was my quest for the Alaskan pack. Same thing, it's massive, but you see claw marks. It's more round than most other dogs, but you can still make that X and it still has that real distinctive sort of triangle, canine triangle. So, at a glance, usually that's what you're looking for with a, with a cat versus dog. A lot of people see dog tracks and assume that it's a mountain lion. That's a mountain lion right over there, and it's very similar to a bobcat track, um, but bigger, right? Bobcats are like two inches, mountain lions can be four or five. But uh, same deal, you, got, you can't make the X, you don't see claw marks. The mountain lion toes, there's better pictures coming to those, mountain lion toes are shaped more like an almond. They have like a pointy front most of the time. And uh, most dogs have a real jelly bean sort of, sort of shape. Mountain lions have almost a pointy, a pointy toe. Cats also have a leading toe. 
Uh, look at the dog track. The two front edges of a dog track of the two front toes are like parallel. They're reaching the same distance. Cats always display a leading toe. Like that's out further out front, right? That one's further out front. It's like your middle finger. If you take your hands and hold your thumbs under your, under your finger, your middle finger will stick further forward. And there's two fingers on this side that are shorter and one on that side, right? That's my right hand. Same situation here. That's the right paw of, of that bobcat, right? That's like his middle finger. And same thing on the mountain lion. That's going to be a right foot on the mountain lion. That's a black bear. Most people probably knew that. They're, they're real distinctive. They've got five toes. That's the back foot. It's always massive. The front foot usually shows up like that. They, they overstep. A lot of animals do that. Mountain lions do it too. But they put their front foot down and their back foot lands in front of that one. Um, so that's the quick version. We'll talk more as we get into there. Enough about tracks. We'll talk more. This, this could take hours if we keep. <laughs> I'll just keep going. So this was an in-person encounter. I am a, I'm an in-person photographer first, right? That's kind of the passion is you want to be there and get those photos, and I do a lot of that. Um, I would rather be there in person, but I, you know, it's hard to get that shot from three feet in front of a mountain lion, right? And it's not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna pull that off. This encounter with these coyotes, this was up Gold Run Road, and uh, this kind of set the ball rolling on my, my my quest for the Hall of Predators, right? I had this cool afternoon. I was sitting out there under a bush and I watched these coyotes come in and they were chasing wild turkeys around. Nobody caught anybody, but it was it was total National Geographic moment. They spotted me and I had some very cool interactions with them trying to figure out what I was doing. I was wearing full on camo and was sitting up under a bush and they were, they were curious about that. Um, but after getting these photos, I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool to have all of those critters around here? And at that point, I was thinking bobcats, um, foxes, uh, you know, mountain lions. We didn't even, wolves were around, but they were not on my radar at that point at all. Uh, so this is a camera trap image of a coyote that is like not special at all, right? It's just kind of like what you get from a trail camera, but higher resolution. Um, it's a good example of like, why camera trapping is difficult because you want to get a picture of a coyote but you want to get like that picture of a coyote right yeah. you set up a camera trap and you get that picture of a coyote and you have to figure out what you have to change what you have to move what you have to do to get the picture that you know that would be way cooler if the camera was lower if the angle was better the camera was too high here it was up on a stump um, there was a lot of things where later i looked at this and thought man that's not a very good picture and <laughs> Refining the process, right? Over time, it takes it takes a long time. We're getting somewhere with this one. That's Gold Run Creek, and I have my camera set up trying for, I mean, I probably put six months into trying to get the critter jump in the creek photo, right? We've got this big rock. This is just down, this is on our property out on Gold Run. And I've gotten trail camera video of coyotes and bobcats and mountain lions and foxes jumping over the creek from, from that rock. Like, it happens all the time. And I, I've got a camera here that just lives here, and so I see it all the time. So I set up my camera, think I'm gonna get it, but then trigger placement becomes just a nightmare because you want the animal to trip the trigger right before it jumps, and most animals think about the jump a little bit longer than you know you want them to. Foxes don't, I've learned, they just, they just go. So you'll get a picture of a fox's tail on the other end of the creek and the coyote before he goes. And then as the batteries die in the camera trap and all those little parts and pieces, things slow down a little bit. So you also have to know what the delay is gonna be between the trigger and the fire. Anyway, all that to say, I've never gotten the critter jump in the creek shot. Someday I'm going to. I have a very similar picture of a fox perched on that same rock. Um, never happened. But you can imagine what it would be like if I did, right? So, now we're getting somewhere with just the setup and the, the, you know, the shot you're looking for. Oh. This is some of my first real success um, with the camera trap when I first started going. We just moved from coyotes to foxes. Sorry, that was a bad transition. <laughs> Gray foxes are probably most common of this little you know, world of predators that we're talking about. You might have seen them in town. I've seen them running across Numa Road up by, the, up by a community church. I've seen them uh, all over. Anyway, we have them. Um, on our property quite a bit. 
but they're pretty skittish unless you feed them in the backyard, right? I know there's people that have apple trees and whatever that they hang out with foxes all the time. I don't get to do that at our house. So I set up my camera trap on this log and this was one of my first good lessons in a really good, um, like predictable place where the animal would be. If you set up on a log like this, this is a, a fallen log that's over like a real marshy kind of area uh, most of the time. And foxes and bobcats, I've learned, are like huge fans of any kind of natural bridge like that, right? They're gonna be on top of it, whatever it is. Mountain lions, not so much. They're down there on the ground slinking around. I've never seen one on this log and I've had cameras on it for a long time. It's interesting because it's a wet spot. You know, mountain lions just skirt the whole area. These guys are right over the top of it. Anyway, you put the trigger in a place where you can predict if you're lucky on which direction the animal's going, then all of a sudden you know your like, depth of field. When the camera is perpendicular to the log like this, your focus is gonna be perfect, right? Because focus works like a plane, right? So I'm, I'm in focus from like here to here, and that fox is gonna be right, right in the middle. Um, so this was some of my first good success, kind of learning some of those tricks. Um, I got this family of foxes, we got a couple of them on our, on our log in the backyard. Um, lighting is the other piece. This is like further refined in my little quest for the photo, right? This has a backlight behind the log that creates that very cool rim light kind of thing. A lot of people tell me this one looks like a, like a diorama at a museum or something, right? Um, because once you narrow down a spot like that, you can create the, the scene a little bit with, with lights. Um, I didn't talk about what you do if the camera trap is firing during the day, right? You can set it up to only fire at day or night, but I don't want to miss one of these guys showing up in the daylight. So for the camera people real quick, what I do for that is I use um, auto ISO to adjust for ambient light. So I'll set in the camera's menu, I'll set the ISO to max out at whatever I want at night. Like let's say it's, uh, you know, 2400 is as high as I want it to go. Because my flashes I know will start overexposing me at that point. So I'll set the max ISO went on auto in the camera's menu to 2400 and then put it on auto. And so if it's daylight, it'll drop down, which basically for the non-camera people makes the camera absorb less light, like the sensor is less sensitive, right? So if it's daylight, um, it'll drop down to you know, 100, 200 and you'll get a, a decent exposure. That makes sense. That makes sense. Because the bobcat photo that I finally got was totally a result of that. Because um, it, it came in the mid-morning, it was a bunch of light. Anyway, lighting is one more step in getting that photo that you really want um, of the foxes. So this was another spot where I got both bobcats and foxes, and I set up there because it was on a mountain lion trail. Um, mm -hmm. My neighbor had a mountain lion come through, got on the camera, and it was snowing, so I went down there and tracked it right through this spot. Mountain lions make a scrape in the ground when they mark their territory. Um, I'll show you a picture of one of those in a minute, but I found one of those right kind of behind this and the trail went right through and I thought this is gonna be perfect. Never got the mountain lion, but I got um, some cool fox and bobcat shots in a, in a snowstorm. Um, kind of created a cool mood because the flashes sort of freeze the, the snowflakes. We'll see, the, we'll see the foxes, or the bobcats in a minute. So another bobcat in the, in the in the woods that I thought was a very cool shot. Um, anyway, gray foxes are fairly common, probably the easiest, I would say, of these predators that I was able to get shots of. I've seen a few in person. This is, we're making the jump to in-person photography, right? This, this gal was just smiling away at me. Um, this was up off of North Pine, right up, right up out of town. I think I was actually inside Susanville city limits. Um, stood on this rock and posed for one. So this photo is a finalist this year for California Wildlife Photo of the Year. It was selected as a finalist. They do like two month entry periods. So January, February, they said, congratulations, you're one of the top three from this month's deal. Now I gotta wait till January 24 to find out, but it's hanging there. I like this picture too, because it shows how you can sometimes get fox tracks with no claw marks, which Canines almost always leave claw marks, but not always, right? Foxes, their toes, their, their nails are pretty high up. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll trick you into thinking they're a bobcat. But 
There you go. Speaking of bobcats, that's the transition that you want, right? On to bobcats. The bobcat story is a long one for me, and I'll try not to give you too much, um, too much time here, but we had a bobcat, all right, run through the backyard and pose for me by the creek, right? I, it was, I saw it coming through the field. It's like, holy cow, it's a bobcat. Grab my camera, forgetting, this is never do this. I've never done this since or before. I had taken a bunch of pictures the previous day for our church and we were making a video. So I lowered the resolution way down. I was shooting in JPEG instead of RAW, which if you're a photographer, you're always shooting in RAW so you can edit better. Um, and I had the like wrong lens on the camera because I was running around town <laughs> taking these pictures. And so I grabbed my camera and I was like, oh no, I ran outside, forgot about the settings, took a couple pictures, and this is like as big as you could ever blow this up because the resolution is too small. That cat sat there and stared at me for 30 seconds, turned around, jumped the creek, and it started my quest for the picture that I wanted of the bobcat, right? Which turned into three years of <laughs> trying to get this bobcat on camera. And I'm, I'm, I've convinced myself it's the same bobcat and it was actually engaging in this game with me. I don't know if it was or not. But we had, this is a video, I'll start at the second. I, I have probably thousands, without exaggerating, trail cam images of bobcats. Lots of them are this bobcat, right? It was all over our property. My neighbors saw it. Everybody saw the bobcat but, but me, right? And it was hanging out all the time. I finally found a deer carcass on our, on our property. And it looked like this deer had died of like natural causes. It was really odd. It wasn't a, it wasn't a kill or anything like that. Um, and I set up a camera on it and nothing touched it. It was like November when I found it. So it was starting to freeze up. I thought a bear would find it before hibernating. Nobody found it until January, middle of January. I went down there and there was all this grass piled up on top of it and this bobcat had found it and claimed it, right? And it was like the food source so I was gonna get this bobcat through the winter. A couple days later, we had a massive snowstorm. I set up cameras everywhere. I set up a photo blind, like a little tent hunting blind kind of thing, not too far away. And I got hours and hours and hours of footage, right, like this, of this guy just, you know, taunting me constantly. And it would stay there. It, would, it, would, it was there all the time. So I got obsessed with going, you can ask my wife back here, there was a couple weeks there, January, February, probably three weeks. I was getting up at four in the morning and I was slinking out to the, I had, I had a set of footprints in the snow that I was stepping in the same prints so I wasn't making sound. In the dark, I wasn't using a headlamp, getting into my little photo blind, waiting for those first little scraps of daylight where I could maybe see this thing and get a picture, right? I was just on a mission. Never got the picture. Never got the picture. Never saw it with my own eyes, but I, I had video of it every, every single night. Um, <laughs> fast forward to September of the next year, right? So now we're like at year three. I was given up hope. Um, I had my camera trap set up on the same log that was in that last video right behind the bobcat, same log where the foxes were. This is one of my flash units over here. And it was like the bobcat just finally decided that it was time to like give me my picture, right? You'll see my flashes fire when it first walks in. And this is like a three minute video. But uh, so there's the first round of photos and this is like the money shot right here. Um, camera's like right here. And it, it just decided to hang out. And, this is a good example too of how some animals react or don't react to the flashes of the camera. Some people worry that it scares everybody. Um, it's not making noise right there. That's the Fleming response. I don't know if you guys have seen that before. Horses and stuff do it too. It's like they get a better sniff when they open their mouth a little bit. Um, but yeah, it just, uh, it just camped out. It was just looking at my equipment and it was trying to figure out what was going on and it, it gave me the photo. And, uh, I'm going to make you watch all three minutes of this because it was three years. Yeah. It was three years. So I took a little nap, was scratching his nails. And this is the kind of thing you never, you can never see in person. It's super rare to have this kind of encounter when you can, um, 
you know, actually watch him just kind of hang out. So my camera trap was on the stump of this tree, and my trail cam taking this video is like right next to it, right kind of back here. So this is this is a trail camera video. But you can see the daylight, right? So it was critical that I had my camera settings so that it didn't get completely overexposed because I was planning for a night shot. Um, when I came down to get this camera, the first thing I noticed was that my flash over on the right, that was all, that stick was broken down and it was on the ground. And I thought the um, cows had gotten out from the ranch next door and had come through again. I was super frustrated. And then I fired the camera up and, and saw this footage. And it was uh, pretty special. So you'll see what he does in a second, but just checking everything out. He's I'm surprised it wasn't still laying there when I came down <laughs> to get the camera. He's not nervous at all. <laughs> but it's uh, yeah, just, just uh, such a cool moment. And it makes you realize, too, like this happens all the time, right? Mm -hmm. This is going on right now in the woods somewhere around here probably right out of town, you know, maybe behind your fifth wheel, you know, that you can't see from the house. They're, they're everywhere, man. They are all over. This is feeling like a really long three minutes now, but I really want you to see them in. Because it gets better. Believe it or not. And I will show you the picture. Which this one's printed up in the gallery, too. If you haven't been up to the gallery on Main Street, we'll talk about that. I don't, I don't think I can fast forward, so there's no option. <laughs> so it starts checking out my equipment. And this camera, this trail camera is shooting 45 second videos. So there's three or four videos here kind of spliced together. But I couldn't have planned it better with the camera placement. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting a good sniff I was surprised it held it at all. Yeah. Then he takes like four more pictures walking out, and that's the last I ever saw of it. But that was the uh, the end of the Bobcat quest. Anyway. So pretty fun. So this is the image in question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that one. The focus point of that one is so perfect. Like it, the way it came out was right where I thought it would be when it when it passed my trigger point it kept walking, which is like the critical thing, because I had the trigger set, and I'm just guessing like how fast a bobcat walks, and I set the focus point a couple steps ahead of that, and it just, uh, it worked out, worked out perfect. This one got some press. This is uh, Outdoor Photographer Magazine. Let me do a little, a little write-up on camera trapping in this shot. So this has been, this has been in a few different um, publications. So one of my first, like, Big successes with the with the camera trapping. Since then, the floodgates have kind of opened. It's like the bobcat has allowed me to see it more around the property. I've gotten a few shots like this where, you know, the, the, nothing nothing on the same level, um, but I've got it walking through several other places. There was a fox shot from the same same spot. There's a moth like silhouetted on its belly right there. That was kind of cool. Um, this is the mountain lion footprints that it's stepping in, which this one was really fun because this was supposed to be a mountain lion shot, but uh, you kind of get an idea of the size difference just looking at the, the footprints there in that same, that same spot. So, same spot in the other pictures from that same one. And this was kind of a magic one. This was the, the same deal with the, with the flashes in the snow. I couldn't, have, I couldn't have gotten any more lucky with the snowfall. Um, I had my camera set up here for a month and was going to move it, and I was like, I was done. I wasn't getting anything on it, and I, I was a storm coming, and I thought I'll just leave it through through the storm, and then I'll go get it. And yeah, this was this was there after, it, so patience is a virtue in this case. Oh, graphic pic, sorry, I didn't, I didn't warn you. This was a mountain lion kill that my neighbors found. Um, I did get mountain lion photos here, but the bobcat came in and started raiding it, and so did skunks and uh, neighborhood dogs, and what else did I get there? Foxes came there, and I got a bunch. Any, any, any carcass, man, is a, a magnet. I'm always telling people on Facebook, like, message me if you have a dead deer on your property. It's a weird thing, but I'll come running. 
Okay, on with, on with the next one. That was your Bobcat journey. That was probably the longest one. I'm sorry, I'm taking forever. How are we doing? Are we okay? Yeah. All right. Black bears. I have never, like, intentionally set up a camera trap to try to get a picture of a black bear. Um, they've just kind of blessed me with their presence, right? Black bears are notorious for messing with cameras. You know, they will just chew on them. Deer hunters know. I see people nodding. Um, they're awful. They, they, they see them, they get curious, and they swat them around and take a bite out of them and then move on their way. I've had them uh, kind of knock stuff over, but I've never had stuff really destroyed. Somehow, I don't know how that's happened, but I've never really gone after them. It's just you see pictures of them on the camera and you think, oh, that's a good picture. I hope it didn't destroy anything. And you kind of watch the footage or whatever and, and hope that you didn't get messed with. Um, this is one of my better shots of a black bear. Uh, I had a camera set up next to this big old cedar tree because uh, I really wanted a mountain lion right there, which we'll get into. Um, but this guy showed up, he's wet from crossing the creek, and one of our really kind of cinnamon color black bears. But again, the camera was set for other critters, and this guy just happened to pass by. And another, another daylight shot that, that uh, would only happen if you have your settings kind of dialed in. <laughs> the fun thing about a camera trap, right, is that you have like a you have like a tripod in the woods, so you you, you can take multiple pictures and stitch them together. It's obviously Photoshop, but I put this one on my Facebook page, and what happens every time anybody ever shows a picture of a bear? Someone says, "That's a huge bear," right? Like everyone thinks there's no scale. It can be a total dark picture with a bear, and they'll be saying, "That's the biggest bear I've ever seen in my life." Like, what are you basing that on? Right? There's, there's no scale. So we've got kind of this debate on my Facebook page about how big this bear actually was. So that was my solution was to just go stand next to it. So big, but not like the monster that, you know, the 800 pound bear that everybody thought it was on my Facebook. That's pretty typical probably for a Alaskan County black bear. I mean, you guys that have seen him, um, you know, so. This bear showed up at the, the wolf cam when I was, when I was after the last impact wolves and thankfully didn't mess with my cameras because the wolves came like the next day. And uh, this, was, this was the first thing I saw when I got to the cameras and was shocked that I hadn't messed with, with anything. Um, it's looking at my trigger and my flash right there, thinking about it, like trying to decide it wants to ruin my, my day. Uh, but I got some fun pictures of that. That one's been popular. That's, that's very similar to that shot before the edit, right? And I kind of edited it into this sort of dark, low-key sort of thing that, that uh, uh, worked out really good for like a, a portrait of your typical black bear. So that's all I got for bears. But I've had pretty good success with them. Um, they're around, right? We see those all the time. They're, they're getting closer to town and in town more now too. I know we've had them getting in our garbage, people have had issues, we uh, secure your garbage, folks. That's my public service announcement for the, for the evening. Because, man, you see the problems they have in like Tahoe with the bears that are just a nuisance. It's because there's stuff to eat around all the houses. So, there you go. Okay, mountain lions. We talked about the almond-shaped toes. This is a better print of a mountain lion. Um, cats also have a three-bump heel pad. Dogs have two, which is more that triangle kind of shape, but it's real prominent in that print. Um, there was no mistake in that one when, when, I, when I came across that. That was out in the desert. Um, you don't expect them to be out there, but this was out like, like Smoke Creek Desert kind of area. Um, they're out there. So on the journey of photography, I had gotten at this point, I had already gotten wolves. So I had pictures of coyotes and bobcats and foxes and, and gray wolves. There's like whatever 50 wolves in the state, right? Unless you don't believe the government, which I get. But they're rare, right? So I'd gotten all these ones, but I had never gotten a mountain lion, a good photo of a mountain lion. So I really made it a quest to, uh, to get one. Um, that was another print, just kind of for size, my fist. So, you know, pretty good size. That's the one the bobcat was stepping in. Um, kind of punched through the crust of the snow a little bit. So this will be a front foot, and that will be the back foot, right? They kind of overstep. The fronts are bigger. They're like the meat hooks, right? And the backs are a little bit smaller. 
Um, this one here next to my camera. This was someone that had, that had seen it on a trail camera and thought it was hanging out. So I went down in the morning and waited it out. Never, never got one. Um, so I want a mountain lion picture. Obviously, I wanted to see one. I had never seen one before this, before November of 18. Um, I'd never seen one in person, right? I knew they were around, talked to everybody else, seemed to have seen one, but I'd never seen one, and I deserved to see one, right? <laughs> um, we found a deer kill on our property, right next to our property, right? And that's it in this, in this video. Um, so I went down and set up a trail camera and just thought I'd get some cool footage of a mountain lion. I got, again, I got a bunch of footage, this is just a little bit of it. Came back the next night, um, Birds, by the way, are how I found the kill. If you're ever out in the woods and you see a whole bunch of birds, magpies especially, go there. Go see what's going on. But I have a whole bunch of video of just the cat being a cat. And I really wanted to figure out how I could see this thing in person, right? They're mostly nocturnal. They come out sometimes during the day, but I decided this was my, my chance, right? So I got all camoed up and I, I hid myself away in the evening, hoping it would come back um, before dark, before the camera was just unable to capture it anymore. And it came back. And I got to see it come out of the woods and have that moment of like, what have I done? <laughs> and I actually, it was super heavy cover. I got photos in person. This is me behind the camera. Um, but it, they obviously weren't the photos that I wanted, right? But I did get to see it. I was watching it for a while before it knew I was there which is a rare thing also. Most, most people don't have that experience. Um, but I started taking pictures with my camera that started clicking and it heard me, right? And I'm, I'm like decked out in camo and it's like click, click, click and boom, it's just eye contact, you know? So I'm, I don't know if it recognized me as a human because I was like, I mean, I was like ghillie suit kind of camo, right? I was, I was a bush, but it didn't like me and it, it looked at me for a minute, tried to figure me out, decided I didn't want anything to do with that, and, and went on its way. Um, I'm convinced, by the way, because again, you study these animals a lot when you're trying to get close to them. And I've read a lot on mountain lions especially. Um, they can kill you, they're dangerous, and all that. But they don't want to kill you, right? They're not hunting people. 99.9% .9 of the time, if they see you, they're gone and you never knew they were there, right? You're lucky if you see one, they want nothing to do with you. If you do see one and you yell at it, it's gonna leave, right? Occasionally, rarely, in an extreme situation, they can be aggressive and, you know, we've all read about those things happening, right? It's never happened, by the way, here. It's never happened in Lassen or Plumas. The closest mountain lion fatality is like Auburn area. Again, urban sprawl getting up against the mountains, right? We've never had any crazy interactions here um, that have made the, you know, the statistics anyway. We have a deer buffet in our woods, right? You guys have seen them all over town. That's what they want, and they don't want anything to do with, with us. So I lean more towards that side. I know people think it's crazy to try to get close to one, but it's like the people that swim with sharks and say that they're fine, you know? <laughs> I used to say I would never do that, but I actually did that last summer. <laughs> it was amazing, but not a great white or anything, right? So I, I don't have like a, like a fear, like a lot of people talk about, of seeing one. Dude. I would love to see one. I've seen two now, and uh, neither one of them ate me. So statistically, <laughs> I'm proving it. Um, anyway, I saw a person, but it was, as you can tell, not the picture that I really wanted. So when this started happening, Last year, um, it was my moment, right? I get them on trail cameras somewhat regularly. I've gotten a lot of footage of them on trail cameras, but normally you get a picture of one and it's gone and you won't see it again for six, eight weeks, right? Maybe, if it comes back through. They work a big area and they just pass through unless they've made a kill or something nearby. So I got this one on a trail camera one night. I got it again the next night. And I thought, ooh, it's something, this is keeping it around, right? So I went, I went running and I set up a camera, but when I was looking where it was, I found a scrape, right? So this is, they like scrape the dirt away with their back feet and like mark the, like pee in it and mark the, you know, scent mark the area, right? And everybody says if you find a scrape, it's coming back, right? That's one of the ways they mark their, 
their turf and they'll be back around to make sure that you know, see if any other cats are around or whatever else. It's like their little communication post in the woods. So I got down there and set up a camera which started like two weeks of sort of cat and mouse, so to speak, with this mountain lion. Um, this is the video trail cam of the same cat <clears throat> in the daylight coming through. Look where it is compared to this big old cedar tree, right? I got it walking through. I mean, you can see footprints almost in the snow multiple times coming through this. So I set my camera up like over here um, because the trail cam before I had it kind of coming this way. I was pretty convinced I was going to get a headshot. Um, didn't get the headshot, right? I started getting it coming across my camera like it was just doing that video. So I got a photo of it coming this way, right? Side note, posted this one on Facebook. Everyone's in a panic because it's so skinny and it's emaciated and it's going to eat your pets. And, you know, don't go outside because it's obviously dying, right? <laughs> 24 hours later, same cat. Okay, it's on a different stride, right? It's landing on those on that on that front right leg. And it's like the ripped muscle mass and everything. You can see they're they're lean animals, right? So it's everybody's interpreting that that muscle as you know this skinny thing. But on the other stride, it looks fat and happy, right? I've never posted a picture of a mountain lion on my Facebook page and not had people tell me that it was skinny. But it's either skinny and dying or it's pregnant. Right? <laughs> That's it. There's no in between. I'm pretty sure this one's a male, by the way, but it was still accused of being pregnant. <laughs> anyway, it kept coming by the wrong way. So I would uh, move my camera and then I would get the tail in again. Right? Walking by the way. This was like a crazy opportunity because they don't stick around. I think it might have made two different kills because it was around for like two weeks. <clears throat> I've heard, I've read, they work on a deer kill for five or six days and they move on. They kill on average about a deer a week. So it was hanging out for two weeks, which made me think probably made a couple kills. Another caboose shot as it came through, I got like seven passes through my camera trap in that time and all but one of them were the wrong way. Right? So I'd never seen its face and I wanted that, that face shot um, and this was the moment, right? But it was later, the snow had melted out. This is that cedar tree that we were behind before. And every time it had come through, it was right here next to the tree. So my camera is focused like, like here. So it was just about out of the frame when I finally got the picture. But this is slow-mo and this is all four shots of the camera trap as it comes around the corner. So it is like locked onto my camera because I just moved it again, right? And it had been by the day before, so now it comes by and it's like that little box has moved again, right? It came around the corner and we just went right up to it, gave it a little sniff and then, and then kept going. But it gave me my face shot, but it was cropped almost all the way out of my frame because I was so convinced that it was going to be in the same spot that it had been in before. So I had to edit it down to more of a portrait kind of shot. There was four of them, you could probably see in that thing. That was the first one or the second one. And that's like the money shots, right? That was number four. Um, and I mean, it came out pretty sweet, but it wasn't the photo that I was really looking for because I wanted that environment kind of shot with the, with the tree in it and everything else. So I had to kind of save it in the edit and crop down, but that was my mountain lion quest. So to be continued, right? I still want that, I still want that shot. Um, I've got a few other shots of different mountain lions. This is where that deer kill was, where the bobcat was. This is a different mountain lion. This was a female with, with kittens, like yearlings, that my neighbor was getting on a trail camera. Never saw, I got them on a trail camera, the three babies, but I never got them on, a, on the fancy camera. This is the, like, what might have been shot. <laughs> this happens a lot with camera trapping. I mean, just if I panned over just a little bit, that would be the coolest photo. Because you know it's just looking out there, you know, into the dark, but. Oh, that was the, that's the shot before that one. But uh, cool, look at that back foot in that one. <clears throat> and then uh, I left my camera in that same spot. It snowed again. This was the same one after the whole quest. And this was the last shot I got of it that winter. It was heading off again, going the wrong way. So I only got the one, the one face shot. Typical cat, right? Not, not going to cooperate. All right, wolves. Try to move a little quicker, and we won't get controversial with wolves. 
because I know we're in Susanville. <laughs> For me, I heard there was wolves in California and they were like in the backyard and I thought, I want to get a picture of a wolf. And I did not know the political like drama that I was stepping into. Um, I've learned a lot since and I think there's valid stuff on both sides and I don't want to get into all that. But <clears throat> I got to get a picture of one, which is pretty funny. I went on a wolf quest before the Dixie Fire and I'd been reading everything I could find about them and talking to ranchers that I knew of and, and people that owned property and people that had seen them. Um, a couple of different guys that worked in the woods that had seen or heard. Um, and I was narrowing down locations and I went out about a month before the Dixie Fire, like middle of that summer, and I, I was getting close. And I set up and I had my cameras set and uh, the Dixie Fire started and it kept getting closer and closer and closer. And uh, you could see him close in the woods, right, in sections, and it was approaching my section. So I finally went, evacuated all my stuff. Um, the woods were closed after the fire for months, right? I got back in there in, I think it was October when I started it up again, when they first kind of reopened the woods, you know, after the fire. They had just kind of announced that they were pretty sure the wolves had survived um, right before they opened the woods back up. I got up there and I found that Forest fire ash is really good for tracking large animals, right? Um, I got into a whole bunch of tracks, kind of in the area where I was before. And I started, I started uh, narrowing down locations, potential places to, to put a camera. Um, again, with the canine tracks, I mean, these were obviously canine to me, but, but twice as big, right? I mean, let's, I'll wear a size 12. So wolves have a bigger front foot than a back foot like mountain lions do. They're, if you look at a picture one, they're all head and chest right there. They're heavy up front and they're efficient. They run all the time, right? So they don't have extra meat where they don't need it. Um, so their back feet are smaller as a result. Um, anyway, I knew I was in wolf tracks. I mean, you're in a place where there's no domestic dogs and these things are massive and there was a bunch of them. I was like, ooh, okay. I found a trail um, where I started seeing tracks going in both directions. And then it was like, okay, now, because wolves, their range is like 500 square miles. I mean, it's a needle in a haystack. But when I saw tracks going both ways, I started thinking this has got to be a spot where they're coming and going, I'm getting somewhere, right? Um, so I, I worked up that game trail until I found a sort of a natural sort of bottleneck in the, in the hillsides with a pretty obvious game trail in the bottom of the gully. And that's where I wound up sort of setting up, where I figured they were probably moving through. Everything I've read about wolves is like the opposite of cats, right? Well, obviously, right? <laughs> but mountain lions, bobcats are, are stealthy and slinky, and they, they don't like always to stick to the game trails. Um, wolves want to get in the line and run a million miles an hour all night long, right? So they get on roads, they get on trails, they get in open areas, and they go. They're not worried about hiding. Um, which is part of the reason they cause a lot of drama because they're not they're not hiding from us, right? We can hear them, we see them more often. Um, anyway, it was very clear that it was a wide open trail that they were hanging out on. This is Photoshop. Don't panic. Um, I wanted to compare a wolf and a coyote. I had a trail camera out there. These are both still frames from video, right? So I took a still frame from the wolf video that came by and a still frame from the coyote and blend those two pictures together just to kind of compare the size. Wow. These guys are big, right? I mean, a typical coyote is, what, 28 inches, I don't know, ish. Wolves can be like 32, 34 at the shoulder. Um, they're large dogs, right? So it's obvious when you, when you see that blur on a trail camera, you're like, that is not a coyote, you know? Um, so I got a couple different clips of last impact wolves. This, I was told at the time, the breeding female of the last impact was a black wolf, right? There was like 10 wolves in the pack at that point. I've heard since that one of the pups was black and this might've been that one. So this is a video with three of them on it. And I was told this is probably three of like the yearlings from that year. So again, this is a year old now. One just went by here, there's two gray ones, and then a black one. So this is why Rod came tonight. Let me play it again. Yeah.
But uh, this was pretty rare footage at the time, right? There was not a whole lot out there. CDFW property, right? On, on the footage. Um, and as I, as far as I know, I was the only, I was the only one trying to get an image of these guys. Um, I did contact the the fish and wildlife biologist. That's like the wolf guy. Um, I've talked to him quite a bit since. He knew what I was up to. Um, I was, I was well within, you know property that I could be on and, and all of that, but it was thin ice, man. There was a lot of people that did not want me out there and didn't know what I was up to. And, you know, some people think any press is bad press for wolves and some nuts going to go shoot them all, right? Other people think any press is good press and we need to get the word out so that more people can go shoot them all, right? Other people think we need to get the word out so that nobody goes and shoots them all. It's just, it's crazy, right? So I got in the middle of kind of all of that. As I was trying to get this shot, um, I got, I, I made a lot of contacts with a lot of people more important in the wolf world than, than I am, right? But uh, I just wanted a picture, right? And there it is. Oh. So this was on that trail like I was talking about. And what made it just work is the Dixie fire and everything behind it. Yeah. Um, it was like 6.30 in the morning, I was fasting. I've still never seen them in person, right? I've never, never ran into one. Um, I still want to, but this was right before I came to check the camera. So that bear I was showing you showed up the night before. The wolves came through 6.30 that morning. I showed up at 7.30 that morning to check the camera. So I like it just missed them, right? I left my camera there for a full other, uh, I think a week afterwards, and uh, never got them again. I actually think I saw tracks of them going around the camera trap <laughs> after that. I don't think they're big fans. Um, but this was the shot that launched my Facebook page into the stratosphere a couple years ago, as far as just people uh, finding me, right? So last summer I got to go to Alaska and photograph Grizzly bears, if you follow me on Facebook, you've probably seen that. That whole trip was funded because of this photo. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah, it was, it was uh, got my website out there and, and you know, all that kind of just exposed my stuff to a whole bunch more people. So this was a, this was a huge blessing. Um, it was not alone. This is a cropped image. This goofy <laughs> brother was on the side of me. <laughs> I cropped this guy out. <laughs> no one's gonna buy that, right? <laughs> that's, that's the real image. This is actually cropped down a little bit, also. But uh, that guy kind of became a laughing stock on my Facebook page. I eventually put that one on there too. It's got to be like sniffing or doing some cautious wolf thing. But it's just <laughs> the ears and everything else. So I'm sure this, these photos happened based on the timestamps on the photos. They happened right after that trail cam footage. So that black one and those two gray ones. I never got the black one on the camera. It's got to be right there, probably out of the frame somewhere. But they went straight up and took these photos from that lower spot. So it didn't look that goofy in the other footage. But uh, this one is on my website, and I have sold copies. <laughs> It's hard not to. It's hard not to chuckle. The contrast. But it's cool. The contrast. The contrast, right? But this is the one you'll find in the gallery all by itself. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that's your tour of the uh, the Hall of Predators, right there. So there's there's the uh, there's the ones I've gotten. So there's there's others, right? There's there's still a quest that I'm on right now. Um, it's all over my uh, YouTube channel. If you're interested, I got a permit to set camera traps in Lassen National Park, which is a rare treat because they don't let you do that in the National Park. Um, but there's a fox, all right? It's not a gray fox, it's a red fox, but it's not a red fox, red fox. It's a Sierra Nevada red fox, all right? They are, the red foxes that we have all over the Central Valley and all over California were uh, introduced species and they've thrived, right? Sierra Nevada red fox are an endemic species that was here from forever ago that were hunted and trapped um, almost to extinction. It was prohibited in the 70s and they just have not rebounded like they thought they were going to rebound. 
Um, they made the news again just this last year. They discovered another little pocket of them. So as far as they know, as far as they know, in California, there's a tiny population of these guys at Lassen and like Caribou Wilderness. There's a tiny population in the Sonora Pass area down by Yosemite. And they just discovered another tiny population along the Sierra Crest. And I forget. Do you remember where that was? I, I saw it on the way up to yeah. Boca about three so weeks ago. Somebody got a trail camera shot of one anyway. So when I started this, they were saying there's maybe 40 or 50 of these guys in the state of California. Right? There's more populations up through the Cascades in Oregon and Washington, but they are endangered and they're really cool. They, they're way furrier than most foxes. They've got hairy feet, like little snowshoe hair kind of feet. Um, anyway, they're in Lassen. They've been sighted. People have gotten photos. But I put on my permit application that I wanted to obtain the best photo ever taken of a Sierra Nevada red fox. I started filling this form out, and it's like a scientific research permit application. And I was trying to like, how could I frame this as I'm doing like scientific research? And I kind of just gave up. I'm like, I'm not, right? I want to get the best photo ever taken of one of these foxes. So I just put that on the permit and they approved it. So <laughs> I have a permit through this year and I'm working on getting an extension because I haven't gotten one yet. It's been almost a year that I've been working the camera traps up there. And, uh, working on getting one of those. All I've gotten so far is Martins, which is very fun. <laughs> There's a little rumor that there could be pine martens on Diamond Mountain. And uh, one time I had a Forest Service guy, you know, asking me for any sign on my trail cameras of a pine martin in our, in our area. I've never gotten one. I've gotten a weasel, which is a relative. But uh, I finally got a pine martin in Lassen Park. Not a great picture. My focus point is up on that rock above it. But uh, that was kind of a rare treat. But that's all that's come out of the... Sierra Nevada Red Fox quest so far. Um, that one is. That one's coming. I'm going to get the Red Fox next, and then we'll see where we where we go from there. Um, so if you want to see more, my Facebook page is uh, where I'm most active online. I do have a website. I'm working and building a gallery website. Um, I'm Randy Robbins Photography. I'm easy to find on Facebook. The gallery is uptown on Main Street. If you haven't been in yet, my wife back there is Joe Robbins. Uh, she's got her office. She's a, a estate planning attorney, and we bought that big old building on Main Street on the plaza with the red stripe on it. It was Verizon Wireless once. Um, that's our place now, and the front part of it is my photo gallery, which is super fun. Um, so if you haven't been, you should swing by and check that out. It is 800 Main Street, and I've got a bunch of these shots up there and um, other stuff as well, so we'll keep, we'll keep them coming. I think that is it. End of slideshow. <laughs> really crazy like that is a fissure. I know Fish and Wildlife got footage of a fissure just north of Lassen Park. Mm -hmm. But I have not heard of an actual evidence of a wolverine. Uh, but I was talking with, do you remember Clancy Ash by chance? Yeah, so there was one like roaming California, yeah, right? Yeah, Clancy that Ash Mama. said he saw um, one. Uh, yeah, uh, they've, they've, been, they've been seen in the Sierra. Um, this last year, and there's been a couple sightings, and there was speculation about whether it was the same one that was like traveling, or if it was multiple, if there's a population that we don't know about. So. And do you have, is the technology there where you can actually see these images from your trail cam on your cell phone? Yes. So there are. I have. I only have one of these because they're expensive. But there are there are trail cameras that are on the cellular network. So as long as you're set up in a spot where you get a cell signal, no. right? You have to buy the camera based on AT&T or Verizon or whatever you want to be hooked up with. Um, and you set it up where it'll send you like a thumbnail image of what it's got. Yeah, so those, that okay. clip of the mountain lion taking the pictures, that was on that camera. So I got that on my phone. <coughs> I went running down and got that. It'll send you like 
like three thumbnails from the video. So you don't see like this fluid big video, but you can tell what was there. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm out in Litchfield, I was walking up the hill, and there was, it was kind of like this, and this, and this, in the dirt, and it was about this big, and this round, and this, and I wondered if that was a big kitty. In Litchfield, just hearing you say that, my best guess would be a badger. I've heard, I've heard lately that there's been some issues with badgers out there on a couple of those ranches. Yeah, they, they burrow like that, and uh, it's very possible. I've never seen one of them either, but they're around, I guess, out in that direction. So, yeah, we, I grew up out in Standish, and we never saw them. I didn't know they were around, but there was, a, I know my, my, my dad had talked to a rancher out there that had issues with them, uh, digging holes all over the field, and they were trying to get rid of them. Yeah. So, possible. Best guess. Yeah? Um, what is the weirdest thing you've ever caught on your camera? <laughs> yeah. There's been some weird people. I've got some people. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? Um, Rod's one of them. Back yeah. Here. <laughs> um, and I had to tell him to quit doing that in case my girlfriend and I were on that. Because <laughs> I've been married for 47 years. Right. <laughs> Animal-wise, what pops into my head is a gray fox and a bobcat trotting down the driveway together. And this was my neighbor's camera, so full disclosure, it wasn't my camera, but um, where, I, where I was set up, when I was getting the, the deer carcass, bobcat, and mountain lion, like that little area, there was, I was getting foxes and bobcats every night. And then my neighbor sent me this clip of the two of them together running down the driveway. And I'd never seen anything like that. I mean, you read about like cooperative hunting and that kind of thing, and they just kind of tolerate each other, but they were like buddies running down the driveway. Yeah. I got this, this last summer, I got a, a baby deer, like a little spotted deer, um, walking up super cautiously, nose to nose with a ground squirrel. It was like straight out of Bambi. I mean, they like touch noses and bolt it. Uh, that was fun. Yeah, as far as like strange things, it's mostly, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of those like mystery trail cam clips that you see, a lot of them are like insects right on the lens of the camera. You know, people will think that's some crazy thing that it's not. You know, but yeah, a lot of that kind of stuff, weird shadows and that kind of thing. But there's been a lot of times where I've had like I'll have two trail cameras, one shoots video and one's shooting photos, so they'll both kick on, and you'll get like infrared light coming from off camera, so the video camera will kick on. And the light of this other one comes on and you can see shadows, but you don't actually see the animal. And trying to figure out what those are sometimes like, which it could be like Sasquatch, you know, huge. Or it could be like a squirrel right up against the camera and you just can't tell, you know. Some of that kind of stuff. Anything else? Yes? What cameras do you use? Like camera cameras? Yeah, I saw I, one was a Canon. I'm a Canon guy. Yeah, so I, uh, I got really used to Canon ergonomics. Funny, I, I borrowed um, Nikon stuff one time, a really nice Nikon equipment, and I just couldn't get used to it. Because everything, if you ever use both, Nikon zoom lenses twist the opposite way of Canon's. So like in is this way on a Nikon, and in is the other way on a Canon. So I just couldn't ever really master it. Nikon's got a lot of uh, like hold one button and twist the dial to do one thing, oh. and like little things that Canon doesn't have that just threw me off. I'm sure if I started on Nikon, I'd be, you know, diehard Nikon. But I really believe, like, I'm not super brand loyalist, you know, loyalist kind of guy, but all those big brands, Canon, Nikon, Sony, Olympus, Fuji, you can't go wrong, you know. As far as wildlife lenses, uh, it, was, it was Canon for a long time, Sony has kind of taken that. There's a Sony like 200 to 500 that I want, you know, but <laughs> probably won't get it. Do you do drone, any drone work with drones? <clears throat> yeah, so I recently got into drones. Um, I did a full on course and got FAA license to be a commercial drone pilot, and I've started. Um, doing that, the rule with drones, I never knew this, but if you're doing anything with a drone other than recreation, you're supposed to have the FAA certification. Mm -hmm. So if, you're, if you want to sell an image that you took with a drone or do anything like that, you got to have it. So I did the class and did the whole thing and learned a whole bunch and uh, 
got a drum. So I've been, been playing more and more with that. I'm not very good at flying it. I don't do a lot of video. I'm doing more, but to me it's a, a tripod in the sky. You know, I do a lot of still photography with it. Yeah, they're fun. Yeah? You mentioned that you were looking at hunting vlogs to learn more about the animals. Do you have like a top three recommendation for other people who want to learn about animal behavior? The book that jumps into my mind when you say that is a book called Path of the Puma by Jim Williams. Jim Williams is a, he was the head predator biologist for, I think it was Montana Fish and Wildlife for a long time. Um, amazing book on pumas. There's one on wolves, and I'm kicking myself that I can't think of the title, but it was like the, uh, the first big study on how wolves interacted, like pre-reintroduction to Yellowstone and all that. I think it was written in the late 80s. Um, if you message me on Facebook, I'll find that if you want. That's a big one on, on, the, on the wolves. But <coughs> Path of the Puma, highly recommend. That's a good, and that gets into other species also. And it talks a lot about how everyone that like manages predators is really trying to manage people. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's a fascinating read just because it talks about we're really just kind of watching what these animals do and trying to adjust what people do to live in the same world with these things, you know? Uh, pretty fascinating. Anything else? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So I've got some calendars and stuff in the bag. If you're sitting looking at those, my wife's back there. She'll take your money. But no obligation. Actually, there were so many. I have a little bit. Yeah. 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 Yeah